welcome to Socrates in the City, Oxford edition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I am, thank you. I, I cannot tell you how, how excited I am uh, about this, not just because we're here in Oxford, but particularly because for me, this is a dream come true. For years, I have wanted to interview Walter Hooper. Uh, and I never wanted to interview him just once. I wanted to interview him in a series, uh, Nixon, David Frost style, not quite, but to really get, you don't get that reference, you're all kids, uh, to really get into some depth because he has such a wealth of information to share about his life and about C.S. Lewis and Lewis's works. Uh, there's no one who can compare. Uh, and it's taken me this long I apologize, Walter, but we're finally here in Oxford to do this. Uh, as you know, this is the second uh, of three sessions we're doing. Um, and as you also may know, we have filmed these seven years apart. But I'm wearing the same clothes. We've dyed my hair to look uh, as it looked seven years ago. Uh, and everything should be the same. You'll notice that we're uh, a little less energetic than we were seven years ago. Uh, and then seven years from now, we'll film our third session. So just so you can follow that, it's just something I've wanted to do. Um, all right, so Walter Hooper, in case you don't know who he is uh, or didn't catch the last uh, session, was in 1963 the secretary to C.S. Lewis. Spent time uh, living with Lewis, working with him, and soon thereafter, when Lewis uh, died on the same day that, uh, the same hour that uh, President Kennedy died, Walter Hooper took on the huge, uh, immeasurable task of doing all that needed be, to be done to sort of secure his literary legacy, uh, to republish works that had fallen out of print, uh, and really to edit uh, his work for uh, decades it's been now. It's just gigantic. So we talked about a little bit about that in the previous session. We'll talk more about that today. But it's a uh, it's a lifelong devotion. It seems to me a calling. And for me, it's a tremendous privilege to get this time with uh, Walter Hooper. So please, uh, Socrates in the City, welcome for Walter Hooper. How do you do? Thank you. Welcome, Thank you. welcome. Thank you. You, you haven't aged a bit in seven years. That's extraordinary. <laughs> Uh, we'll edit that out to preserve the illusion that we did this in, uh, in the same day. Please uh, have a seat, and uh, we'll continue our conversation. You talked about Lady Collins with her green velvet furniture and the chihuahua and her jade cigarette holder uh, and her Georgian tea set. You really were forceful in asking not only that she published this new work of Lewis's, which was... Uh, these poems that you had collected, this, this volume of poems, but also you said that you need to put out uh, two of the, the old books. Uh, do you remember uh, which, which those, I'm sure you remember which they were? Yes, the, the Pilgrim's Regress and the Abolition of Man. Okay. Now, when had the Abolition of Man come out? Is that 47? No, it was, it was 42. 42, oh. Um, and the, the other one, the Pilgrim's Regress in 30, 33. Okay. Do you remember when they went out of print? Well, they were uh, coming and going. Um, okay. Publishers um, often tell you, uh, they always told me, yeah. that you say there's no call for that. Well, you can't find out if there's a call for the abolition of man unless you actually put it there in, right. in print, right. and then people will buy it. Yeah. But they can't buy it if right. it's not there. Right. So I think um, it had probably not been published for, so about five years. Okay. Well, the reason I ask this is because I, I realized uh, between our last session and this session that most people who aren't in the publishing world don't think about this kind of thing, but when a book goes out of print, it's gone. And we, uh, who are readers, uh, probably don't think very much about that. We just assume that everything's in print. And in this day and age, uh, things really never quite fall out of print in the sense that you can always get a copy on Amazon. You always can get a used copy, even a used paperback. But the idea that uh, it's 1964, you're meeting with Lady Collins, 
And the books of C.S. Lewis, which we take for granted as being in print, of course they're in print, we can get them anytime we want. Think back uh, 51 years to a day when you could not get the great works of C.S. Lewis. Now, when I say the great works, I think they're all great. But the idea that the abolition of man, a seminal prophetic work of Lewis's, that that would be out of print is a staggering thought. And so I say this to underscore the service that you provided, not just to Lewis lovers, but to humanity. Because this is, I would say, one of the classic works of the 20th century, which was out of print. And if you... Uh, 20-something hotshot American upstart that you were to dare say to this patrician figure, Lady Collins, that you must put out this back, uh, th th this, this old book. It's an extraordinary thing. And what you did then, and I want to hear about the subsequent uh, demands that you made to these poor old people who couldn't stand up to you. Uh, <laughs> what a monumental service it is to the world of letters. Uh, I'm not trying to embarrass you, but I, I think that it needs to be clear that uh, this one uh, little young man from North Carolina comes to England and does this, and if it had not been for you, and this is clear to me, this wouldn't have been done, and it is entirely possible that what we know of Lewis, we would not know of Lewis. And I, it's one of those things that, you know, it's like trying to think of, what if the South had won the Civil War or something like that? I mean, you, you, I cannot imagine the world without uh, the works of Lewis being well known by millions of people, uh, many hundreds th that I've discussed him with. So uh, did you have any sense in 1964 as a very young man in that office with the uh, intimidating Lady Collins uh, of the importance of what you were doing? I think I did, because as I, I mentioned earlier, in my argument with C.S. Lewis, we didn't know who won at that time. But, his, but I'll remind you of the argument, which was essential for me. He was very worried about what would his, his older brother, who was a, a retired uh, army officer, would live on when he himself died when C.S. Lewis died. And I said, he will live on your royalties. But then he pointed out what was well known, not to me, yeah. but I mean to people like him, is that once an author dies, then his books after three years trail off to almost nothing. They right. stop selling. And I said, well, yours won't. And... He said, well, sometime an author has a resurrection like Sir Walter Scott is having now, but that's very rare. I said, you needn't even worry about it. And finally he said, I don't understand. <laughs> who is this American secretary who tells me I don't need to worry? Why don't I need to worry? And I said, because your books are so good and your readers are not that stupid. Well... I believe that, and he believed what he said. But then right after he died, I saw Blackwell's bookshops. His books were already remained. They were getting ready to bury him, as it were. Anyway, someone, a, a publisher, had said to me, a new book helps to sell old books. And at that time, I was trying to complete Full Lewis, the book that he was editing before he died which was a volume of poems. Yeah. But he didn't know very many of his poems. He didn't know where they were, right. how to get to them, because he had so few of his own books yeah. in his house. You said uh, much of this uh, seven years ago, this very day, uh, and I find it typical of Lewis uh, in the way that he was... Um, oh, almost ridiculously humble. And, you know, part of it is his Christian character, yes. and another part of it is sin, yes. I would say. Yes. Uh, uh, and I would say to his face if he were here, because I challenge people on that. You can be overly humble, and I think that sometimes it, you can do great harm. And the idea that they had such little... Uh, res he, had, he had such little respect for his own work, it's actually 
you know, it's like somebody saying, well, I can commit suicide because I can do what I like, but I can't kill you. It's like, well, no. Uh, you, you know, you have to treat yourself in the way you want to treat others, just yeah, as you should exactly. treat others the way you want to treat yourself. Now, I, I say this in part because the, this episode with the manuscripts, um, I think we touched upon it in the last session, but he had very little respect for his own manuscripts. They would throw them away. When Warney was, his brother was um, worried about having to move or wanting to move, being afraid that he couldn't pay rent or afford the kilns, you, you said that he was um, getting rid of papers. Or maybe when I Definitely. was with you a, a year ago, we spoke about this yes. privately. But I'd love you to talk about this, that Warney, his brother, uh, who was his secretary for so many years, was simply burning Lewis's papers, not just manuscripts, and we can talk about that, but all kinds of other papers that anyone, whether the Wade Center at Wheaton today or, or anybody, would love to have. Uh, uh, papers, uh, letters, um, even you know, tax records of this literary giant, just to have a sense of who he was, something for his biographers to pour over. W what happened when you uh, were there? When did you see this happening, and what did you do about it? Well, I, I was living with Austin Farrer and Catherine Farrer in Keeble College. They had wanted me to come back after Lewis died. And remind us who Austin Farrer was. Austin Farrer was the, the theologian and uh, the, the warden of Keeble College. He ran one of the colleges. And his wife, Catherine, was a writer who, um, who lived with him, of course, in Keeble College. And one of the most respected men in Oxford, and they had been particularly nice to, to Joy. Not all the dons in Oxford liked her, but they felt that they should be as good as to that, that friend's wife as possible. Also, that they had had a knowledge, a first-hand knowledge about her cancer. So... Um, they felt very sorry for Lewis at this time. And so, but they knew how brilliant he was. Um, they saw me editing the, the letters. I mean, they wanted, they knew that I was willing to do that. So he urged me to come back. He says, I have a feeling there's a work for you to do here. I want you to come back. Well, I didn't know what work that was. But I was soon to find out, because while living with them, I went out one day to, to the kills to see Warney. And um, Warney um, tended to um, uh, panic over anything having to do with money. And the, the Lewis estate had just um, the, uh, had, had to pay 20,000 pounds on death duties. So his, his whole estate was evaluated at 59,000, and so they only got 39,000. So that looked uh, pretty small. But as I said seven years ago, you see, Lewis was giving away two thirds of his income. Right. So it didn't rep really represent what he made in royalties. Right. So in one way, I was trying to be realistic, but he. He, he, he panicked. Warning panicked. So panicked. he panicked, and then he thought, I won't be able to afford the, to pay the rents on this large house, so I'll move out to a small house. Now, the rents, just to, not that I care too much about these things, but just to be clear, I thought they owned... Well, they did own the, the kills. It was owned by, uh, jointly, Mrs. Moore. So they were paying um, rent? No, they, no, but rates, you see. You have to pay rates. Oh, the rates. The city rates. I didn't understand. So, taxes. No, no. Uh, yes, That's taxes. That's what you mean, taxes. Yeah, taxes. That's what so, uh, no, he could have lived that rest of his okay, life. Okay, okay. Um, but he felt um, he pa panicked, and so he bought a smaller house, and so he was having moved into the small house, and that will get rid of a great many things. So um, I think also he had the feeling that the old, the good life is over. Get ready for purgatory now. And so he was getting rid of all of his brother's papers. 
And uh, I went out this particular day, thank God I did, because Paxford the gardener met me coming up to the house, and he said, I'm so glad you came, because this morning, Major Lewis gave me all of uh, Mr. Jack, C.S. Lewis's, notebooks to go on the barn fire, which has been burning for three days. I, I mean, and he I, said, I, have to, no, no. I have to stop you. <laughs> I cannot believe, this is something out of a movie, and it ought to be in a movie. The idea that this bonfire, first of all, was burning for three days, yes. what does that mean? I can't quite, uh, I'm from Manhattan in New York City. We don't uh, have bonfires. What, what, was, <laughs> what was going on? In other words, what, what were they burning three days running? They were burning uh, various papers of C.S. Lewis. Uh, there were various, say, lectures that he had given. He kept the, the manuscripts of them if they hadn't been published. So, um, and uh, George Sayer, one of his friends who wrote a biography, was pretty sure that he'd written a sequel to Surprised by Joy. I don't know that. But we thought, well, if, it, if, it, if he did write it, it's gone into the bonfire. I just, so, um, I, I, I'm just stunned. Um, was Warney, uh, you know, in his right mind, do you think? I mean, it seems like he was a very anxious uh, person, but that's an extraordinary thing that he might be burning a great manuscript. Well, when, when this came up one time, um, he said, but I didn't burn any of the diaries of the Lewis family. He cared really only about family papers as opposed to, say, professional papers. In fact, he wrote a letter to me um, a f shortly after that, pointing out that he had, um, he and Jack had brought over all the family papers, their father and mother's letters, their grandfather's diaries, or uh, I mean, eleven volumes of papers. Anyway, he was at that time. He spent 1932 to 1933 simply going through those papers and copying them onto the typewriter so that they make up. Uh, tw uh, 11 volumes of typewritten papers, about 300 pages each. And then, he said, he went away and came back to find that Jack had burnt all the original family papers. So, you know, Jack didn't care. He said, there are already copies of them. You know, you've just... So Warney wrote copies. this to you in a letter. He did. Did you... Do you have the letter, or did you I burn do. it? I, no, I, I think no, you should burn it. I, don't, I, I never burn it. Let's burn anything. it tomorrow. <laughs> burn it right here. No. Uh, uh, we'll get the last laugh, so, I'm warning. So, um, well, I, I, but this is unfathomable, and I, 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 I don't want to run past it too quickly. Let me ask you as well, and I don't know if you can answer this, but when I hear things like this, uh, very little uh, is known about warning, certainly compared to, to C.S. Lewis. Was, was his faith anything like his brother's faith, or was his faith more uh, of a nominal faith? Because when people are so anxious and so worried, I, I, I worry that, uh, that he, he really didn't have any place to take his grief. He had a, he had a faith. He had, it was not nominal. He had come back to Christianity at the same, same time that C.S. Lewis had in 1931. Oh, really? And so when he came back from China, you know, they each discovered they had all, both come back to the faith. Warner always insisted that Jack was not converted. He said he was always converted. He just returned. But Lewis, I think, knew about what his own faith was like. And he said, no, I had lost it. And then I gained it through the conversion. But Warney said no. No, but he, he said no about his own brother. But I, mean, I think his own faith was never shaken in the sense he never became a rabid um, um, atheist. But he was a very firm believer. And, um, and, and that, you know, there was no doubt at all. But he really did insist that, that his brother, Jack, uh, had never fully left the faith. That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. And he always said that. Yeah, I think he, he in one way, 
believe that, you know, this is sort of the army thing. You, you know, one doesn't behave irrationally if you are, you know, army people. Um, you know, and also good Irish people from uh, Northern Ireland. But, uh, I mean, Lewis's diary, I mean, his, his own uh, biography, Surprised by Joy, it tells a different story. But in the sequel, he refutes it. <laughs> well, we wondered if that I, was the sequel, yeah. but if so, yeah. we won't find it. My goodness. Well, so you uh, come upon this scene. Now, is it Paxford? Paxford, the gardener. The gardener. Yeah. He said that up there of all these notebooks there, um, I, he said to the major, I'm pretty sure Mr. Hooper would like those. And the major said, well, if he comes today, he can take them away. So I went up to the kills, and he said, yes, yes, Paxford said you wanted these, these um, notebooks. And I found so many papers that um, they, would have, they filled two huge suitcases. And I said, but <laughs> I don't think I can carry both of those. Uh, today, could I come back tomorrow and get the rest of them? No, whatever you leave today goes on the bonfire. So, Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> well, why, no, no. why do you suppose uh, he was um, hankering to burn these papers? Oh, I think because he needed, he needed to move into a smaller house, so he needed to downsize, as you'd say today. Well, okay, now that we know that you did... Well, what happened? How did you get them out of there? Well... <laughs> Um, I didn't know, and I wasn't, I, I wasn't a rich man at all. I, I had almost nothing to live on. So I dragged them the mile down to the bus stop, and then I got the bus into town and dragged them into... But I was young then. I was only 32. <laughs> and... Um, that made all the difference. You dragged the, these heavy suitcases filled with... Now, what, was there, in fact, anything in there of, of considerable value? There was. There, there were not only the 52 notebooks, many of which had essays and things which I published over the years. Can you give but us an were, example of, of an essay that w would have burned? Um, well, they were... Um, Yes, um, a, a number of the essays, like on uh, on, on prayer, and um, um, on Addison, are mainly literary essays. And where you know, where uh, where have they been published? Because they've I, been published in, in selected literary in the, essays, okay. published by Cambridge University Press. Yeah. So they were quite a lot. Lewis didn't save the letters that were sent to him, but he did save a few letters from really important people like E.R. Edison, who wrote the, the Worm of Robberus. Lewis had corresponded with yeah. him for years. He, he always cites th that book yeah, yeah. Uh, as a tremendous influence on yeah, him. Yeah. I've tried to get a copy, and I haven't, but I, you know, I'd like to read yeah. what Lewis read. Um, he cites a few other things, obscure yes. books, but that's one of them. Yes. And so you're saying that he, he did correspond with Edison. Well, yeah, he did. Yes. Um, Edison, fortune preserved all of Lewis's letters, and Edison's daughter and I, this is some years later, we got together. I said, I have um, your father's letters to C.S. Lewis. Um, and she said, well, I have Lewis's letters to my father. So we agreed to both put both collections into the Bodleian Library. So it's a wonderful conclusion to our story. And are, are there still letters uh, and notebooks, diaries, things of that nature that have not been published? Um, no, most things have been published. But th those letters to Edison are all in volumes two and three of the collected letters yeah. of Lewis. And then there were a good many letters from Dorothy L. Sayers. Uh -huh. He saved those too. Yeah. She began corresponding with him in 1942. And thus it led to a long correspondence. And many of his letters, have, uh, his letters to her have been published in collected letters. Yeah. And then some of um, 
all of her letters have been published, most of them by Barbara Reynolds right. in the four volumes of collected letters right. of, of Dr. Uh, so, yeah, I remember Barbara Reynolds uh, spoke at the centenary, the, the, uh, either here in Cambridge, yeah, I don't yeah. remember. But one thing that I have heard recently that shed some light on the burning is that I think I remember seeing in, in Warney's uh, rooms uh, a note about Jean Wakeman. This is one of Joy's close friends and who became a close friend of mine, um, coming by to get some things. So I think she had been there before I went up there. And he showed her some things that had belonged to Joy, including 200 poems, some of the best works of, of Joy Davidman that um, were just there, um, and family letters that Joy had written to people, and the letters that C.S. Lewis had written to Joy. I always wondered what happened to them. But when she died about two years ago, uh, they found in her basement the letters, the, the poems, the love sonnets they're called, of Joy Davidman, and other letters from Joy, but a loss at the bottom of the heap. This was on the, uh, in the basement, in the very cold, wet basement. They found the letters to uh, Joy from C.S. Lewis, the earliest letters, but they just were rotting, and they were, they're not recoverable. They're not recoverable. No, but we now know what happened to them. The pity is that Jean was a, a crippled woman and she couldn't really get down to the basement. Then she spent the last 10 years in a, in a nursing home. But I, I was a close friend of hers, but I think we never talked about that because I think she forgot. You know? Unbelievable. But at least she preserved some things. And I think Warney, she had appeared there before Warney, and then I came, you know, about a week later when most of things, a lot of things, many things had been burned. Did, did Lewis keep uh, in, in his notebooks or, or did, did he have diaries? Because I cannot remember. I feel like I should be aware of everything published uh, under his name, but w were there diaries or journals or things like that that he wrote that have been published? Yes, yes. I... I um, edited a volume of diary. Um, it's called the diary, the All My Road Before Me. Oh, yeah. okay. It came out in 1992. Okay. And this covers the years just 1922, 1928. It didn't keep it very long. Mm. But that was partly, those, those, those diaries were recovered from the bonfire. Those? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You dragged so, uh, them down the hill, a <laughs> mile down the hill. Yeah, but I was strong then. I was, I was a bigger man then than I am now. I, uh, I'm shrinking. I think even in this state, you, you wouldn't have left them to burn. I can't imagine you would have left them to burn. <laughs> no. You might have tackled warning or something. But uh, I, I, I'm just, it's unfathomable to me that these treasures were poised for the fire and that you happened to be there to rescue them. I mean, it's a very fitting picture. You know, if I were to invent the film version of this, I would, in, I would invent this story uh, to sum up what the, you have the, done the, with your life. But it's very nice to have this picture of it and to know this is actually true. But I <laughs> don't want anybody to suppose that Warney didn't love his brother, that this had anything to do with it. Yeah. He loved him very, very much. Uh, no, that's, and in uh, one yes. way, yeah. getting rid of all of these things is part of the love, yeah. you know? Yeah. Oh, it's clear, I mean, that they, that they loved each other and that they were best friends their whole lives. That's why it's just so... Uh, it's, uh, only somebody who's that close to someone else would maybe yeah, have the freedom yeah, yeah. to do something like that. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a hands-off attitude because you'd feel like what's his is mine and what's mine is his, and they probably shared clothes, for all we know. But... Um, it's, uh, it, it is extraordinary. Uh, so this is 1964. Uh, you have saved treasures from literal uh, fire. You uh, take the collected poems to uh, Lady Collins in London, I guess. Well, no, no, the collected poems were published by Bless. But she came later. What did you take to, to Lady Collins? Uh, they stand together, the letters of C.S. Lewis to Arthur Greaves. Uh, okay. 
So that was what you were presenting yeah, her yeah. with. Mm -hmm. Did you did did Blessed uh, uh, do any other work? You said that they went out um, of business. I think. Yes, they did. Yeah. They were they were um, Blessed had already died. Um, uh, Jocelyn Gibb took over the firm, but he wanted to retire, so they just uh, gave up the business. And so the Lewis estate, I, by this time, I had become one of the three trustees, and we had to decide who we would give the, the, all this Lewis's uh, uh, works to. I mean, who's going to take them over? Well, Collins were already publishing the, the Narnian stories in paperback. Right. So they had the best claim to them. And Lady Collins had already brought out a number of paperbacks because Bless didn't bring out any paperbacks. So she was the natural person to do it. It turned out to be she was ideal. But because we also have the benefit of a literary agent, uh, Curtis Brown, and the, lady, the ladies in Curtis Brown knew what Lady Collins was. They knew how glamorous she was. And so they said to me after that first meeting with Lady Collins, now look, we know you are under the spell of Lady Collins, but we are not. We are immune to her spell. So if she says, you know, what about a 10% royalty or 5%, you probably would say, oh, why bother with royalties? Just you can have them in there. But we are immune to her charms. So you that's when we come in and settle you know, right. royalties. Right. But don't say anything about money, because you'll give it all away. Right. <laughs> Well, oh, what? So, th so this was was this 1964 that you were with uh, Lady Collins in London? I think, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, at what point did you realize that this might go on beyond uh, this juncture? I mean, you did you have a sense that there were years of this kind of service ahead at that point? Well, the um, uh, things were changing at that time. One of the uh, important works. It was not an important work in itself, but it, but its but its publication was important at that time. Was God in the Dark by the Bishop of uh, Woolwich, and this had unsettled the faith of many many Christians at that time. He argued, and Lewis had seen a chapter of that and had been asked to um, to comment on it, which he did in an essay. Anyway, the, in honest to God, what the bishop said at that time was roughly that you can't trust um, metaphors or images because they're always, they're not literally true. So he said, when we say that Christ came down from heaven, that's not literally true because it sounds like a man in a parachute coming down. So in fact, we just don't know. We can only say something like he entered the universe. Well, when Lewis was asked to comment on that, he says uh, the bishop has told us something that we already believe for many centuries. All language is metaphorical. The language of the scientists is much as those of literary scholars. And he said when you exchange, say, he came down from heaven, for he entered the universe. It sounds like you've said the man didn't come down in a parachute. He went from the garden shed out and in, in, opened the door into the drawing room. But you can't be absolutely literal. But at least the, what we have in the Bible is inspired metaphors. So therefore, we should give more credence to those than anything we make up. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, it's, it's, um, you're just exchanging... Metaphor for metaphor. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You can't yeah, escape yeah. The, 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 the idea of the metaphor. Yeah, the, but, and and then, so God in the dock was the response. Yeah. And then in America, uh, the, a man came, uh, what was his name? Some You may remember, who said, God is dead. This school of thought was present in America about the same time, same years, about 65 or 66. Yeah. And um, so... 
there was a lot of falling away of people at that time. And many of even the clergy who had admired C.S. Lewis, and they were beginning on the bandwagon of right. the new garden, um, you know, all these, yeah. the unbelievers, yeah. the new unbelievers. But one of the things that had happened um, was the, the meeting of the Vatican Council between 1962 and 1965 in Rome. And I thought, how, can, how does this benefit the C.S. Lewis estate? Well, I saw one particular benefit. Um, John the Twenty-Third, who opened the council, Pope John the Twenty-Third, had made a statement which I thought sums up exactly what Lewis himself believed. He said in that opening statement of the council, the deposit of faith and the vulnerable truths of our tradition are one thing, what you call the revelation. But presentation of that truth is another thing. But the presentation must always bear the same sense and meaning. So there's the everlasting gospel. There are ways of making that gospel known. But if you make them known, like screw tape letters, of the Narnian Chronicles, it must also bear the same sense and meaning. You must have the gospel. If you kick the gospel out, then, you know, it doesn't make any difference what the presentation is. If it's no longer Christian, it's no longer Christian. And so I thought, what Lewis writes, you know, he is writing the screw tape letters to enforce the truth. So you can see things from a different angle. But he's not actually saying things are changed, just say, let's look at it from this angle from then from another. In the Chronicles of Narnia, he said to, um, to a number of people who, who thought they were allegories, he said, no, they're not allegories. It's a supposal. He said, let us suppose that Christ, the, the second person of the Trinity, not Jesus, but the Son of God in heaven came down, not to earth, but to a land of talking beasts and became a lion there. What, what happened? Well, that's the Chronicles of Narnia. So we see Christ living out his life as a talking beast, as a lion. Mm. And, the, and many people, of which I am certainly one, in one way, I cannot now separate my love of Jesus from my love of Aslan because they're the same. Mm. You know? Well, I mean, this gets to the other point, uh, or to another point regarding Lewis, is the, the power of his imagination no, no, to no. dare uh, to begin to think yes. about this supposal. Yes. I don't know that there's anyone who ever lived capable of doing it. it yes. It's a... It's such a powerful work of imagination, yes, especially for someone who values theological orthodoxy. Yes. It's an extraordinary thing. Uh, Bonhoeffer said uh, that you know uh, every sermon should have a shot of heresy in it, which means that to really speak the deepest truth, yes, we have to almost flirt with heresy. Yes, we have to be willing to go out on a limb, some people won't be able to follow us out on that limb, but if we really know what we're about, we can, we can get away with it. Yes. Lewis could get away with it, and there were people, and there still are people, who, who couldn't follow him out on these limbs. They're, they're mortified that, that he would do this. They think of it as blasphemous, but the rest of us are able to see more deeply into these truths because he's enabled us to do that, but there have been very few people in history and in, in, in uh, the world of letters yes. who've been able to pull this kind of thing off. Well, I think one of the, the reasons I know that he succeeded with children is that children still write to him, and I reply to those letters. Oh. I'm still acting his secretary 50 years <laughs> later. And um, I put most of those letters go in the Bodleian Library. But one of the sweetest I think I've ever had was from a little boy called Josh. And the teacher said that she had these 
I think there were five or six-year-old boys in her class. Um, she told them that Lewis had died, but they wrote to him anyway. <laughs> and little Josh said in his letter, Dear Mr. Lewis, I'm sorry you've died. <laughs> I just want you to know how much I love Aslan. <laughs> but I mean, his love of Aslan was much more on his mind than the death of the author. Yeah. He didn't quite understand what happened to him. They're just sorry he died. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. But that, that's in the Bodleian Library. But so one of the things, I'll go back to that period of the Vatican Council. One of the things that interested me very much was the decree on ecumenism, when it points out in the decree on ecumenism that there's truth in other Christian beliefs other than Catholicism. Yeah. And this made it possible for Catholic readers and admirers of Lewis to like his works um, because it was now possible for Catholics to realize that there was truth in other works, of Christian works, as well as being in Catholic. Mm. And, you know, I think it's probably uh, a good thing that Lewis was a, an Anglican at that time because no Catholic writer would have been encouraged to take such liberties as Lewis did. Yeah. Well, also, um, he then, didn't then. come across as a particularly staunch Anglican. I mean, he came up with the term uh, mere Christianity. Yep, yes. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, if I'm pushed, I would describe myself as a mere Christian. You know, that's my uh, denomination. And I think Lewis helped people uh, in some ways avoid, uh, you know, the, the, the straight jacket of, of a particular denomination and just to say that I'm... Uh, I'm with Lewis, yes, I'm with historical yes. Christianity, I'm with traditional Christianity. Um, I, I think that that's a, something he, he may have intended to, yes, to some extent. Would, do, you, do you think that, that that was intentional because he is so appreciated yes, across yes. the spectrum? Well, he told me one time, he, we were talking about New Christianity, but he said, suppose, say, um, uh, you know, the main street is um, uh, the corn market. Suppose a group of Martians suddenly appeared in the Corn Market Street, right in the heart of Oxford, and they said to the people who, who stopped out to, to talk to these Martians, we've only just got a minute. Can you tell us what Christianity is? We've heard about it from Mars, but we want to know what it is. He said, I'm afraid that one would say, well, down there, they put too many candles on the altar, and down here, they don't really do anything like that. And so it would be one, you know, denomination talking about how awful the others are. And he said, I fear that the Martians would have to go back without discovering what the faith is. So mere Christianity is partly an answer to what are the core beliefs. This is the main part of what Christianity is. And so far, it seems to have served that purpose. Mm. And even the Catholic writers like that too. And um, they, I've discovered, um, in, well, fairly recently in, in uh, modern time, that Pope John Paul II uh, liked Lewis very early on. In 1950, says his, his um, biographer, he was already reading with his students the screw tape letters. And then in 1978, when he became Pope, he mentioned in one of his, his, his sermons that this, the four loves which he loved was on a level with the writings of St. Augustine. And in 1984, jumping ahead, I, I was invited by a priest came to Oxford to see if I would come and visit the Pope. Well, I thought, this is just, I can't believe that he wants me to come and see him. So uh, I said, well, I'll think about it. <laughs> and I thought, I just don't believe this. Anyway, I don't believe that, that you said that. 
<laughs> well, he got back and he said, I realize how very busy you are, but couldn't you spare five minutes with the Pope? I said, of course I could, you know. So anyway, you I, give went seven, there, right? I, I went there in 1984, November, and had an audience with the Pope. I was simply terrified. He began by saying, do you still love your old friend C.S. Lewis? I thought that's a very pastoral thing to say. You still love him. I said, oh, yes, Holy Father, both friendship and affection. He said, oh, you knew I liked the four loves. I said, almost everybody in the world does, you know. So he talked about that. But then he had read Mid Christianity and many of the other works as well. And then he wanted to know from me, this is why I was there, what was he like? Well, I did my best to say what he was like. And at the end, I hoped he would say something about Lewis. And I think he knew I was waiting for him to say something. So at the end, he said, um, C.S. Lewis knew what his apostolate was. I didn't want to know whether he'd finished. And then he said, and he did it. And I thought, that's the nicest thing ever said about Lewis. He knew what his apostolate was, and he did it. You know? Because you can know what your apostolate is and not do it. But here's a man who did it. And he knew what he should do, and he did it. And he's also uh, effectively calling Lewis an apostle. Yeah, this. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going back to saying is that I realized from the decree on ecumenism that Catholics were now free to, to read Lewis, and they began when many of the Anglicans were becoming, and many other denominations were, were caught up in, um, you know, in liberalism. There were some new readers of C.S. Lewis, and I was keen to catch those new readers. So I went to every conference that was, I was invited to, to give talks on Lewis, you know. And when I went and joined uh, Alice von Hildebrand in 1989 at Steubenville, I found that most of the Catholics were there because they wanted to hear me talk about the abolition of man. Yeah. And when uh, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, came to Oxford, Cambridge in 1988. I didn't see him at that time. But he gave his talk on the abolition man. Ratzinger. Because Ratzinger... Whatever is, happened to Ratzinger? Well, he became <laughs> Pope, Pope uh, uh, Benedict XVI. Oh, come but on. As, um, as before he became Pope, as you know, he, he said the biggest danger we now face is the dictatorship of relativism. Yeah. And so that explains why he would have cared so much about Lewis's abolition of man. The abolition of man is absolutely prophetic. Yeah. There's yeah. no question about yeah. it. Um, you know, when we say prophetic, people uh, think we're talking about getting direct revelation. It yeah. needn't be yeah. direct revelation. It can be direct revelation. Um, but I would say that someone's understanding can be affected by revelation and it's kind of transmuted into something like the abolition of man. Yes. But Lewis's ability to see these things, there's no way to describe it except prophetic because yes. he's saying things that are so deeply true. Anyone might have seen these things, but yes. it doesn't seem that anyone else did. And that's what makes a prophet a prophet. Not that they're saying something that doesn't exist, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're speaking it, and other people recognize it as true, but no one else is speaking it as true. For him to write The Abolition of Man so early, you said 42, yes. mm -hmm. it's an extraordinary thing. Well, and I think you probably realize, you know, the first series of talks, on the male Christianity talks, are about natural law as well. Yeah. They are on the moral law, as he calls it. But you call and it so, natural law. He wouldn't yeah. have called it natural law. No, he, he wouldn't, because he didn't want it to be thought to be a Roman Catholic term. Yeah. I mean, after all, he used different terms to make it fresher. Yeah. You know? He never yeah. actually mentions the resurrection, the resurrection, but he talks about when Christ rose from the dead. You know? I mean, so he avoids 
well-known words which, you know, sound like traditional Christianity. Um, he tried to give it a fresh approach. You can it's still true, even if though you use slightly different words for yeah. it. Well, okay, it can be more true if you use yeah. slightly different yeah. words. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. the yeah. thing, um, that he said that you cannot really see it if you've seen it so often. You become inured to what you're looking at and you no longer see it, you take it for granted. And we have to recast it. And that's what he was doing in the Narnia books. And when you recast it, suddenly people can see it. I've actually found that if I'm reading a verse of scripture uh, in, in a foreign language, and if I know what it says in that foreign language, it's uh, refreshed. Yes. And I can actually hear it yes. in a way that I can no longer hear it in English because the English has become stale. I've heard it so often. And there are terms like resurrection. I would say this is when vibrant green faith becomes dead religion. It becomes ossified and you can have the trappings and the but lack the power thereof. Yes. That's, that to me is Lewis's principal strength, yes. is that he was able in so many different ways and so many different genres to um, refresh our understanding of immutable, eternal truths. That's a tremendous accomplishment. Yes. I cannot think of anyone in the 20th century who did it uh, in anything that can yes. compare with, yes. with how he did it. Yes, it's, a, it's a one of his essays on the um, um, fairy tales say better what's to be said. Yeah. And this, the quotation um, is in, in the... Uh, we wanted to get past those Sunday school associations yeah. and uh, the stained glass of, of association, which sounds almost and we talk, as though we were talking about a medical matter some way to get past those watchful dragons that keep us from attending to the, the, the truth. Mm. And getting past those watchful dragons is what he did so well. Yeah. You know? He was willing to talk about the Narnian stories with me. He didn't really like talking about his own book. But um, we talked about, uh, I so told him the one time that my favorite character was Puddle Glum in the, the, the silver chair. And he says, well, you know Puddle Glum pretty well. You met him a number of times. He's Paxford the gardener. I based it on him. Paxford was the most pessimistic man who ever lived, <laughs> but he wanted the nicest. But he, uh, Lewis gave me a very good example of his pessimism, his Puddle Glumishness. He said when he and Joy were going to Greece in 1960, Joy's cancer had returned. And they were going with their friends, Roger and Lu June Lancelin Green. But he said, him, I, an old man walking with a stick, Joy with cancer return. What were we doing going, you know, to Greece of all places? Anyway, he said, the last straw seemed to have been arrived when Paxford came out to say goodbye to us. He was always listening to the wireless, the radio. And he said, well, Mr. Jack, there was this airplane that's just gone down. <laughs> Everybody killed and burnt beyond recognition. <laughs> Did you hear that, Mr. Jack? Burnt beyond recognition. <laughs> and on that note, said Lewis, we flew to Greece. <laughs> wow. I think we all have a little... We, we all have Paxfords and Puddlegums in our lives, and I have to say, I find it hard to like people like that. But... Uh, yeah, and Puddle, it's funny that you say Puddle Glum is one of your favorite characters. He's one of my least favorite precisely because that kind of thing oh, really? drives me out of my mind. Um, but this brings me to something uh, uh, else, but Puddle Glum, the, term, the, the, the name Puddle Glum makes me, puts me in mind of it. Lewis's imaginative power uh, is uh, evidenced in part by his ability to create names and words. Puddle glum is genius. The, the term puddle glum, 
Puddle Glum, uh, for those of you who re remember, in the it's in the Silver Chair, that he yeah, only appears yeah, in the Silver yeah. Chair. But he's described as a per particular creature called a marsh wiggle. When you read that, the, a marsh wiggle is sort of brown, a little bit like a, a, a salamander or, or a creature or something like that. But, but he invents a creature. To be able to plausibly invent a new creature is absolute staggering genius to do this effectively. Because anybody can come up with some stupid creature that it, it isn't plausible, it's just a hot But he creates a plausible creature that never existed, yeah, yeah. gives it this name of a marsh wiggle, which is just brilliant, and then names the marsh wiggle Puddle Glum. It's so appropriate. Lewis did that innumerable times in the Narnia Chronicles. He did it um, with, um, I think maybe my favorite is when he's talking about, uh, and I always get them mixed up, it's not in the silver chair, uh, it, where he's talking about the land of Bism yes. and, and uh, th th that, which one? Is that the silver chair? That's I, the silver that chair. That is the silver chair, yeah. The, 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 he's talking about this world underneath this world. Yeah. And this is, again, just outrageous power, imaginative yeah. power, to create that world and to say that it's inhabited by these kinds of creatures. But he gives them names yeah. that I find delightful yeah. and hilarious yeah. and apt. G-O-L-G, yeah. uh, Golg is such a strange name. Yeah. It's the land of Bism, B-I-S-M, Bism. Yeah. And it, he over and over again does that kind of thing. And it, it's very hard to pull off, but he does it. Uh, and it, it shows me, it, it's, a, it's part of how I see his greatness. Yeah. Well, not only wonderful names like that, but distinctions, you know, for children to read, Here's one of the most important distinctions, I think. I wonder how many adult books have anything as brilliant as this in it. In the, in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, they stop uh, at this island where, they, where the people are invisible. And um, Lucy goes in and into the magi magician's house and she wants to read the spell that would make them visible, and she does in the end. But she also is attracted to the magical book because one of the spells, if you say it, will help you hear what your friends say about you. And she can't resist it, and she says it. And so what she sees is like a train journey. These two friends of hers uh, want her close friend and then uh, somebody she doesn't know very well. And the close friend is intimidated by the bigger girl, who said, are you still seeing that little Lucy Pevensey? Oh, well, I, I don't really like her very much. I mean, she just throws herself at me. I'm just, you know, I'm friends because she wants to be friends with me. And poor Lucy breaks into tears. And then Aslan appears, and he says, you know, eavesdropping you know, in a, in a, but reading these spells is the same as eavesdropping in real life. But will I ever forget it? No, says Aslan, that's the problem. You won't forget it. But he said, there's a big distinction you should make here. There's a big difference between what your friends say about you and what they think about you. And your friend thinks very well of you. She loves you very much but she was afraid of that girl. To make a distinction between what your friends say about you and what they think about you, what modern novel has anything as profound as that in it? Well, this is the thing. I mean, the, the reason that Lewis is so amazing and I hope will last forever is that I, I can hardly think of anyone who has such an array of gifts, yeah, yeah, tremendous yeah, yeah. wisdom, humor, um, and as, as I say over and over, tremendous creative power, imaginative power. I, I can hardly think of anyone who's his equal. Yeah. There are passages at the end of Paralandra that are unlike anything yeah, I yeah, have yeah, ever yeah. read. Uh, he doesn't seem to get a tenth of the credit that he should in the Academy. Yeah. Uh, have you seen that? Uh, 
effect as you've put his work out there that, that's, that, that people in the academy, uh, people who decide what ought to be part of the Western canon, uh, have, have you seen them uh, turn away from Lewis? Because it seems to me that if the world weren't crazy, some of his works would be taught. I mean, uh, for example, Paralandra ought to be taught alongside Paradise Lost in a, in, a, in, a, in a survey course, for example. It rises to the level of genuinely great literature, much greater than many things that are now part of the canon. Um, well, I think, um, I think part of the... Uh, the um, you said someone told me yesterday that you were talking to somebody who um, said Lewis was not very popular here. Um, when I first came to England and first got to know Professor Tolkien, he knew I was puzzled as to why, say, Magdalen College, Thumble Dance had not liked Lewis. Um, he said, you see, in Oxford, you are only alarmed, forgiven for writing two different things. You can write works on your field of study, like history or art or theology or whatever it is. And you can write detective stories because all dons at some point get the flu and they have to have something to read in bed. But you're not forgiven is writing popular works on some outside your field, especially popular works which become internationally famous. Mm. But he said, Lewis knew that. But the reason he wrote them was because he was driven by his conscience. He knew his apostolate. Yep, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, he knew it would cost him too. Yeah, you know? he knew, but his faith was strong enough that he didn't care. He, he was uh, doing what he felt God called him to do and made him to do. Um, but I still am amazed that some of his works, I think most notably probably Paralandra, yes. are not part of the canon of Western literature in the yeah, 20th century. Yeah, yeah. It seems to be something that, it doesn't fit in with the narrative. Yeah. I mean, the idea that Jack Kerouac's On the Road or Allen Ginsberg's Howl or any number of works that are infinitely inferior yeah, yeah. to Paralandra would be thought of as appropriate to be in the canon is, uh, has much less to do with literary quality than to do with the fact that they, they plug into the narrative yeah. somehow, uh, that uh, you know e even works uh, by um, Fitzgerald or Hemingway, they're they're okay. They're not. They're not. There's nothing spectacular about them. Uh, even Faulkner. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm not stepping on your southern toes by saying it. But but some of his stuff just seems pretentious. Yeah. Um, and yet, the 20th century. That was the time to be pretentious. That was the time to try to do things that screamed, look at me, I'm a modernist, or look yeah, at me, yeah. I'm a postmodernist. And if you didn't do that, um, you were likely to be ignored. I also know that has everything to do with Lewis's outspokenness about his Christian faith. Yeah. Um, but have you ever talked to anyone about that issue, that, that Lewis, that, that some of his works, which are so great, and the Narnia books are mm -hmm. probably the ultimate example, but they sort of disqualify themselves because they're thought of as kids' literature, but, but the idea that he's not accepted in, in that way. Well, I noticed that, that Lewis's newest books and those of Tolkien almost never reviewed in any of the papers, any of the journals, even though they will sell in the millions and the others won't. Uh, in 19, 2000, I think it was, some of you may remember better than I do, but there was the, one of the largest polls ever taken of, of books in this country, the largest mm -hmm. poll amongst readers, yeah. not about critics. And anyway, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings was number one, and The uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was number 14. So they were very high on the list. And... I was appalled to see that they were condemned. Every, all the newspapers condemned these uh, the critics, yeah. condemned Lewis and Tolkien, yeah. because they believed something else. They didn't really like Christianity. They felt a strong desire to strike at it in this way in the poll. But as 
as I'm reminded what some of the talking family, I said, don't worry about this. After all, it's the people, something like 400,000 people are the ones who said your father's work is the best that is. And Lewis's work, the best that is. Yeah. So I wouldn't worry about that. No, you know? certainly not. So, but I found that you know, when I was getting started here and pushing Lewis's works, one of the people, of the people who um, never were on my side were the clergy. And I think they were jealous. And they said, he's far too easy. He doesn't really know what he's talking about. Well, I think the fact is that Lewis really believed the faith. And he, he didn't talk about the problems of the faith. He just said, this is what it is, you know? Um, and people were able to believe. I remember asking Lewis one time, when, when Christ says, go into the world and preach the gospel, do you think he meant that they could believe it? He said, of course. He wouldn't have said, go into the preach the, the gospel unless people had the capacity for believing it. Well, I think, you know, when you've got professional theologians who made their livelihood out of writing you know, books about why it's so hard to believe and why, you know, you shouldn't believe or why everything right. is so impossible. Um, you know, for somebody to come along and say, Jesus is risen, <laughs> and people believe it, it's hard on them, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, they say, how on earth, I mean, could, the, you know, could, uh, you know, in St. John's Gospel, could they know how many fish they well, they counted them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not a, a, a symbolic number. If they, they counted the fish, people still do. <laughs> that, that, the, uh, <laughs> one of the most powerful arguments for the um, historicity, I guess, is the word of the Gospels, yes. is the number 153. Yes. That there were 153 fish. Yes doesn't sound like a metaphorical number to me. Yes. Uh, it, it's, you know, if, if the number of fish were 144, <laughs> I would say, let me tell you, that's a metaphor. Yes. 153 is anti-metaphor. <laughs> it is meant to be literal. And that's the kind of thing. Lewis brought that literary sensibility to everything. Yes. And it's an ability to see things and an instinct that uh, resonates with readers. They, they get that. It doesn't resonate with people who don't have that instinct. Yeah. Um, which actually brings me to another subject. I don't know how much time we have, but when we were talking about the silver chair, uh, I, I just keep thinking of things that make me love Lewis. The, the scene with the giants, the, what were the names? Har, Harf, Harfang? Harfang. Harfang. Mm -hmm. Even that. He comes up with the name, the House of Harfang. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, I don't know what etymology he's yes. drawing on to, to come up with that. But they're these, the, these giants, and they're sort of strangely charming yes, giants. Yes, yes. And, <laughs> and then they, they see uh, Puddle Glum and the kids were escaping, and they say, come back, come back, or we'll have no man pies yes, for yes. the autumn harvest feast or something like that. The humor, the dark humor... Yes is extraordinary to me. Uh, the, and, uh, the, the, where they open up the book, the cookbook, and they say, you know, human, uh, uh, something, something little biped, you yeah, know, or whatever. Yeah. The level of humor, it's brilliant that, that he can pull that off. Yeah. And I dare say that there are lots of great writers who couldn't pull off all these kinds of things yes, mm -hmm. together. But uh, the, the reason I bring that up is that in that moment in the silver chair, uh, Lewis is able to create a moment of horror. There's humor, but there's horror that, that these giants want to put these humans in, in a pie and eat them. And it's that kind of horror that you find in Grimm's fairy tales or, or something like that. I can't think of too many other examples where Lewis does that. The only example, uh, which I wanted to bring up at some point, and I don't know how much we can get into it, but part of what, I guess it was you discovered, was a manuscript of an unfinished novel 
called the Dark Tower, yes, exactly. which led to some controversy. But what was that? Um, where was that manuscript, by this the way? This was one of those that was in the the um, notebooks. It was a manuscript amongst the things that were being burnt um, when I took back to um, Keeble College. You dragged the Dark Tower down <laughs> the did, hill yeah, in the yeah. suitcase. <laughs> I did, yes. This is so no, amazing. No, no, okay. No. So uh, it wasn't just a few literary essays. Yeah, it was no, the Dark Tower. No. Okay. Well, the Dark Tower, for those who don't know what it is, is, uh, as I said, an unfinished novel by Lewis. Yeah. It is... Um, a little bit unlike anything else he ever did. When was it written? Maybe 1939? I think probably about 1939. It was to be a sequel to uh, uh, Out of the Silent Planet. Before which he wrote Perilandra. Uh, before he wrote Perilandra. It, was to, it, it sounds like the sequel to Out of the Silent Planet, which was published in 1938. Yeah. And so this would, you know, was written probably during the, at the beginning of the war. But before he began Perilandra, it was partial. He had written part of it, but didn't know how to go on with it. So he just put it aside and then started something else. And never came back to it. He never came Which back happens. to it. Which uh, happens. It happened to Dr. Seuss. I just yeah, read the, today. The, the, that, uh, well, but it, it's the kind of thing, of course, I'm a writer, that the, you, you, know, you can do that. But So he writes this... Um, uh, for, it, it's a fragment. I can't remember how many pages. Maybe 80 pages or something yeah, like yeah, that. Mm -hmm. I remember maybe it was uh, in 98 or 2002, finally reading this and realizing that in some ways it's unlike Lewis, but in, in other ways it's, it's clear that it is Lewis. Yeah. Uh, the, the horror of it is you, you get glimpses of it in the rest of the Space Trilogy. I mean, these moments of real evil, real menace. Yes. Uh, and he can create an otherworldly horror that is so creepy that, uh, again, it shows you his imaginative power. But uh, the, the Dark Tower, um, I don't remember, when was that published, uh, finally? Uh, 1977. 77, okay. Uh, some people who will remain nameless eventually uh, accused you of having either written the Dark Tower or having, having written parts of the Dark Tower, Dark Tower and, ha and having then slipped it into the Lewis oeuvre uh, just to, to, to get it out there. And I, when I read The Dark Tower, I didn't know you, and I didn't know too much about the controversy. I said, let me read this and let me see. But I read it, and whatever that instinct is made me so, oh, this is definitely Lewis. This is, it's too good to be anyone else. Yes. Now, I don't know your, your uh, writing abilities, but I thought there's something something about it that the, it's those flashes of the Lewis genius. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a very creepy story. But um, wh what was that like to have people take your um, uh, genuine love of Lewis and selfless service of, of Lewis and his work and, 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 and accuse you of having tried to profit from it in that ugly way, not just financially, which they also accused you of, but, which is ridiculous, but, but to try to, 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 to be sort of a, a literary parasite. I mean, it reminds me of it. It would make a great novel, <laughs> except it seems to me not just untrue, but you know, scandalously untrue. But what was that like, if you can just tell us, to live through having to deal on, with this? Uh, it went on for 25 years. Um, and there were three volumes involved by the same person. I was uh, very sad at first. Um, and the question was what to do. And um, my mother had said a number of things that I, they came to my mind at that time. She said, if you can't say anything nice about somebody, then don't say anything at all. I'm sure your mothers have said the same thing. But that came into my mind. I think God wanted me to have something simple to rely on. If you can't say anything about, nice about people, don't say anything at all. So I never replied. So the controversy, so-called, was completely one-sided because she said many, many things. I said nothing. I still think probably I did the right thing. But it was very, very painful, and um, 
And I, I, I thought in the end, the pity is that a person chooses to spend her whole life just um, heaping abuse on somebody else when it would be better to do anything than that, you know. But I think, you know, the person who uh, does that is going to make themselves more and more and more unhappy. It was very painful to live through. And um, when that person died, um, well, Michael Ward, whom you know, came to say, uh, tell me, I think you should know if you don't already, the person who's been persecuting you for 25 years says, die. Aren't you going to rejoice? Well, I, I don't know what I would have done except that that was not what I wanted to do. So what helped me was to say a rosary for that person one seven days in a row, by which time I felt, you know, I didn't want to rejoice, you know. And, um, but anyway, then it was right after that. I don't know whether this person would have cared about this or not, but, but you and I both know that there appeared uh, one of Lewis's pupils, uh, Alistair Fowler, who had written a piece in the Yale Review. He didn't know anything about the controversy. He simply decided to write an essay in the Yale Review. Yeah, yeah, he, was, he was Lewis's pupil in 1952? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. And, and he said that, you know, besides talking about the, the thesis that he was writing, Lewis was his supervisor, they talked about the things that they were writing, um, um, poems, novels, and so on. And uh, Lewis showed him The Dark Tower, and he said, I just don't know how to finish it. I don't know how to go on with it, you know? So I haven't done anything more in years. So uh, Alistair Fowler liked it. Anyway, he said in this piece, you know, out the, one of the things that he took home to read was The Dark Tower. So how could I, um, when I was a tiny little boy, <laughs> have, have written it and forged it? It's just not possible, is it? Well, these kinds of things happen all the time. Uh, I only realized recently that Harper Lee, uh, who obviously wrote To, Ki to Kill a Mockingbird yeah, yeah. in this awful sequel. It's not even a sequel. Uh, it's kind of a para-novel. Yeah. But it was said that uh, Truman Capote had written uh, yeah, yeah. To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> and uh, you know what that must do, because you can never refute these things yeah. 100%, there's, there's always, uh, there are always people who are sloppy and who yeah. will hear these things and so on and so forth. But um, yeah, for what it's worth, th this has been put to rest uh, more than once. I mean, it's, you know, uh, it's, it's very dead. But it's, uh, it's, still, it's still interesting, the idea that to be, uh, to be so closely affiliated with, with someone's oeuvre, uh, it really strikes me as, uh, the idea for a spectacular novel, uh, yeah. you know, sort of like the Aspirin Papers. I can't even remember the plot, but the, but the idea of this literary uh, skullduggery. I think Stephen King could do it. Could yeah, he? yeah. <laughs> perhaps he could. Yeah. Uh, but I don't read his trash. Yeah. No, that's not true. He's a good writer, <laughs> but I, I actually don't read King. But I I um I just think it's such a great idea for a novel, especially since I know that it isn't actually true in this case. But I just love Lewis's. Uh, uh, just that fragment again. It's just such a treasure. There's so many, there's so many treasures. Um, you told me um, that you'd had a conversation with a Skylab astronaut about the dark tower. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, tell that story? I will. I'm one of the most unusual visitors that I've ever had was uh, Joseph Kerwin. Joseph Kerwin. He, he he's a medical doctor, but who's also an astronaut. And he said that he was, um, he was educated in a Jesuit institution, and he was led, while there, he read Lewis's um, uh, science fiction, uh, Out of the Silent Planet, and the others. And this led him to become an astronaut. 
Um, wow. He was the doctor in Skylab when he and other astronauts circled the Earth for a whole... In, in the, the uh, late 70s, uh, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah, for a month. Um, he had become very fond of the dark power, and he spent his time... <laughs> He had quite a lot of time in the sky lab, and he, he tried to complete the, the, the dark power. I haven't seen his completion of it, but he, was, he, he visited me twice here and talked about writing. But the, the then, idea that he was influenced to become an astronaut, because no, no, there yeah. haven't been too many of those, yeah. by Lewis's yeah. science fiction trilogy. But well, he said that after they they came down to Earth from Skylab. You don't mean that he, literally. Uh, well, I mean, when they, they got back. <laughs> well, they, um, he, uh, no, no, not when they literally. When they re-entered no. the universe? When they re-entered the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Went from the kitchen into the drawing room. <laughs> but he, um, he said he and the other astronauts agreed that Lewis has a better, gives a better example of what the Earth looks like from space in the out of the sun and planet than they ever could, having been there. Oh, that, that's, that's just amazing to me. And also, the idea that someone uh, had a copy of a book that you brought into the world yeah, the, that was the, published the, in 1977 and that in that year or in 78 was in outer space yes. with, with this book with your name on it and Lewis's name on it reading it and trying to complete in outer space yes, yes. the dark tower. Yes. Uh, that is another one of those thoughts, one of these images yes. that is, it's worthy of Lewis. It's just powerful and strange and beautiful. One argument Lewis and I always had to come, he said, you think too highly of my books. I said, you don't think highly enough. You win the argument. Which of us do you think is right? Yeah, there's just no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. Well, I've seen this kind of British diffidence and humility, and I think it can be as bad as the, the cockiest uh, kind of chest-beating hubris. It really can. And I, and I think that we've established that, that Lewis was on that side of this problem. Um, what a joy to have this time with you, Walter Hooper. Um, I hope that seven years from now, the jacket, shirt, and everything else will remain, and we can come back uh, for a third session. Don't lose any more buttons. I, yes, yes, every seven years. Um, but uh, I will, uh, no one knows what he means by that. Um, I, uh, I'm just so grateful to you. This really is a dream for, for me uh, to, to be able to do this. One of my heroes is, and friends now is Dick Cavett, and he had um, the, the privilege of long conversations with uh, tremendously interesting people. Nothing can substitute for it. Uh, to, to be on a TV program for 15 minutes yeah. uh, or to be interviewed, it's just not the same thing as to have a conversation. So I want to say again, thank you for... Uh, being willing to to share uh, your stories and your wisdom and your thoughts, uh, I'm I'm so just deeply grateful. And I know the folks who are going to be watching this and sharing it with their friends are also grateful. I, it's hard for me to believe that uh, almost nothing like this exists. You've done all kinds of interviews, but really to have a, a conversation. So we'll continue the conversation in a few years um, on this very stage with the same carafe of water, uh, but for now, we'll say goodbye, and maybe uh, it would be appropriate to have a warm Socrates in the city, Oxford. Thank you to Walter Hooper. Thank you.